Okay, chapter 9, and this is about the musculoskeletal disorders. And as usual, there is an introduction. Uh, some of them are important to know, and some is just a revision. So the, the, the bones in general are going to be classified into long bones, short bones, flat bones, and irregular bones. And um, the long bones are anything that have a long shaft, like here, humerus, ulnar radius, even here, these bones, anything that have a shaft, this is called the long bone. Short bone are these tiny bones, specifically here. Do you remember the carpal bones and the tarsal bones? These are the short bones. Flat bones are something flat. Flat like the sternum is flat, the scapula is flat. A regular bone is something like the mandible, for example, or the vertebrae. So how can you describe it? Is it flat? Is it long? Is it short? It's none of those. It, doesn't, it does not have a, a specific shape that you can describe. So just call it irregular. And the, the, the different types of bone cells that you need to know are the mature bone cells are called osteocytes. The, the bone producing cells are called osteoblasts. So if, if your bone is growing, it's actually the osteoblast, the one that's growing it, not the osteocyte. Osteocyte is going to maintain. Osteoblast, make the bone, osteocyte maintain it. And this is important to remember, okay? Osteoclast, break down the bone to take calcium out of it if needed. Okay, so this is something that you actually need to know. Types of bones, you also need to remember, generally speaking, that the bone can be compact or cancellous bone, which is called the spongy bone. So if you, if you look, if you take a section of any bone, you will see it from outside compact, okay? From inside, you will see like spaces inside of it. Looks like a sponge, actually. So you have compact and cancellous bones. The bone from outside is called periosteum, from inside is called the endosteum. This is the structure of, um, of the bone in general, and you can have an idea about that. And here it is, the, the long bone, anything that have a shaft, what is this? What is this bone? Looks like a femur. So this part here is called the epiphysis, and here is the other epiphysis. So those two ends are the epiphysis, and the shaft is called the diaphysis. Skeletal muscles, just generally speaking, skeletal muscles are these muscles attached to the skeleton. It's voluntary muscles. And they help you to move and maintain your position and stabilization. And these muscles, they attach to the periosteum, whether directly or through something called tendon. So what's a tendon? The tendon is a connective tissue or fibrous tissue attaching the muscle to the bone. This is a tendon. If it looks like my finger, like this, cord-like, you call it tendon. If it looks like a sheet, like this, you call it aponeurosis. This is A and P, but some of it is important in, in, um, in pathophysiology. Uh, the covering of the muscle Inside is endomesium, in the middle is perimesium, outside is called uh, epimesium. Neuromuscular junction is the motor unit first is a motor neuron with the muscles innervated with it, for, from it. And the neuromuscular junction is the junction obviously from the name, neuromuscular, so the junction between the nerve and the muscle, right? And the neurotransmitter that's used here is acetylcholine, and this is something important to remember. I don't know if you remember it or not from a &P, but if you forgot it, you still need to know. So if these are muscles like this, it is a muscle like this, and you have a nerve coming to it. Those two, and if you go to something else, you call it motor end plate. <coughs> or motor unit, I'm sorry, motor unit. The transmitter that goes from the end of the nerve to the muscle is called acetylcholine and you need to remember this neurotransmitter. This is the most common one.
So when acetylcholine is um, released and go from the nerve to the muscle, the muscle are going to under, under, uh, uh, do some changes, releasing calcium and the muscular contraction will occur. Now the joints, and this part is actually important to know. Very important. The joints are classified in different ways, but by the degree of movement is the most important. If this muscle does not move at all, you call it synarthrosis. If it is slightly moving, you call it amphiarthrosis. If it is freely moving, you call it diarthrosis. And this is something that's very important to remember. Okay? So synarthrosis is like this. Do you remember the skull? Like this is a parietal bone and this is a parietal bone. And there is a suture in between. So this is considered the joint, right? Because you have one bone and one bone that they come together, articulate together. So it's considered the joint, but do you move your skull? Can you like move your two parietal bones against each other? You cannot move it at all, right? Zero. So this is synarthrosis. Amphiarthrosis is like the ribs. If you look at this, you can move a little bit like this, right? If you try it, you can move the ribs with the sternum just a little bit, but nothing much. But look at this now, I can do all types of movement, like my shoulder or my hips. And this will be the arthrosis. The structure of the joint itself, so the, the freely movable joint that's called diarthrosis is called the synovial joint. Why do you call it the synovial joint? Because there will be an end of one bone, like this, and another bone is here, and you have a membrane like this, a capsule, and fluid in between, and this is called the synovial joint. So the end of the two bones, there is a synovial membrane, there is a cartilage, like this. Which is called the articular cartilage. And this cartilage that I made it in red here, is that it is there to make the movement of the two bones sliding against each other. It's not bone with bone, that would be too hard and too painful. So this is the function of the cartilage, the articular cartilage inside like this. Okay? And this is also an important part to know from the anatomy and physiology. So there is a capsule outside, there are ligaments and there are menisci and bursi. What does it mean? Menisci, these are pads that are located like this. To prevent over expansion or um, over movements, excessive movements of the joint. To prevent excessive movement. Did you hear about somebody who's athlete and have a meniscal tear or something like that? Have you heard about this? So this is the meniscus. The bursi are fluid filled sacs. Something like this. A sac here that contains fluid. A sac that contains fluid. So this is called bursi. Okay? And these are all important things to know. Why do we have each one of those? So why do you have the cartilage? Smooth movement so that the two bones do not articulate with each other. There will be friction and you will lose it. That's why we have cartilage covering it. Bursi fluid felt sacs. Menisci, these are uh, pads that prevent the overexpansion or, or the over excessive movement of the joint. And of course you have the fluid, you have the capsule, and then you have some ligaments attaching the bones to each other like this. Okay? This is a structure again. So this yellow, what's this yellow here, if you're following? The articular cartilage. This is the joint cavity, this is the fluid. This is the capsule right here. How to diagnose musculoskeletal, uh, musculoskeletal problems? Musculo means muscles, right? Skeletal means skeleton which is bone. And this is what we're talking about, muscles and bone, basically. For bones, you can do radiography or scanning. For muscles, there is something called EMG that we need to know. I usually say that 
diagnosis and treatment is not the most important except when I let you know, right? So this is important to know. For bones, you do radiography or scanning. For muscles, you do electromyography, electromyography, EMG. This will measure the activities of the muscles and it can tell you if the muscles are good or not. And you can take biopsy only if there is a suspected condition with the muscles itself. For the joints, you can also do radiography. Um, you can enter an, an endoscope, which is called arthroscopy, and you can do an MRI. And you can examine the synovial fluid as well. Now, there are different types of fractures. So this is the beginning of the abnormalities. There are different types of fractures that we need to know of the bone. And the classification of the fracture is, it can be complete or incomplete. That's number one. If it is incomplete, means the bone is still one bone. It's not like two pieces, okay? Still one bone and part of it is fractured. If it is complete, it means the one bone, like my humerus, is two pieces now, okay? They separate from each other. This is called complete. It can be open, means compound. Compound with what? Compound with the skin. So if, if I have a hit here, if you hit yourself like here, okay? The skin can be intact, but the humerus is broken, right? This is not compound, this is simple. But if the skin itself is affected, I call it compound, okay? It can be also simple or commutative fracture. Simple means stay in position, like, like let's say this bone for example, okay? So if you have a fracture here, you call it incomplete, right? If it is like this, you call it complete, right? If the skin is affected, you call it open or compound. If, it is, if the skin is not affected, you call it closed. Now, is it simple or commutative fracture? How to know? <coughs> this is simple. How can it be commutative? Like this. Remove this now, and the bone will be like this, moving, and you will see pieces like this. Okay? This will be the commutative fracture. So many fractures, and it's not, it's, you lose the alignment. Multiple fractures and losing the, um, the alignment. Do you understand the difference between simple and commutative fracture. This is important to know. Simple, you do not lose the alignment. You just fix, use cast or something, and it will heal. <laughs> this is not the same as commutative fracture. Commutative fracture, you have multiple fractures, you lose the alignment most of the time, and you have fragments of bone, just like the one that I described right there. Okay, so this would be, this is simple. And this is commutative. Uh, compression fracture, on the other hand, is bone that can be crushed. Something like the vertebrae, the, the bones of the vertebral column. Like if you fall down from two floors or something and you're falling straight on your feet. The whole weight will compress your vertebrae and you have compressed fracture. So this is a type of um, fracture that the bone is crushed or collapsed. This is one scenario, but the other scenario is if the bone is having a problem like osteoporosis or something, without even, fall, even falling from that much, you can just do compression fracture without even falling down or something. Okay. Um, if trauma happens, fracture can occur, uh, it can be Im impacted, like force, something happened to it, a force came to it or something. It can be pathological, and this is what I was just talking about, it can be a pathological condition. So did something hit you, um, did you fall down, something like that? No, it's just a compression and the bone is pathological, like having osteoporosis or something. A stress fracture, depressed fracture, like the skull fractures, and it is going in. Like if you feel the skull, you see a depression. And this is called depressed. So here are the different types. Community, you see multiple fractures here. This is open because the skin is actually open, which is called compound. Uh, 
can be pathological condition like tumors or something that's causing it, and so on. Um, this is spiral, like twisting, if you're having a child or something and twisted his hand. It will cause a spiral injury. It's not going to be like transverse like this. It will be spiral, okay? It can be transverse like this. This is just broken. Um, this is a green stick fracture. One side only, and the bone is just bending. And they call it green stick because if you have a green stick from a tree in your backyard or something, and you uh, bend it like this, it's not going to completely break down. If this is dry, you, 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 and you bend it, it will break down completely, right? But if it's green and just you bend it like this, just a little piece will be broken, but the, the stick is still one piece, right? So this is why they call it the, the, um, uh, the green fracture. Uh, this is called the coolest fracture. And the coolest fracture is a fracture of the distal end close to the rest. And you need to remember this. These different types are actually important to remember. So compression fracture is like the vertebrae. Coolest fracture is the fracture of the end of the, uh, of the uh, ulna or radius, specifically the radius, um, close to the rest. Coolest fracture, fracture of the end of the radius, close to the rest. So this is something important to know. Spiral fracture is twisting. Green stick is an in infant, in uh, children or infants. Okay? If somebody have a fracture already, what's going to happen? The first thing that's going to happen is bleeding. So if a fracture like this happen, it's going, it's going to bleed inside. And this bleeding is where the granulation tissue is going to build and start to building new bone. Have inflammation first, swelling, pain, and then uh, the, the, healing, uh, the healing process is going to start. So what's the very first part of the healing process? Hematoma. So this is important to remember. The first thing that's going to happen is bleeding like this. And this bleeding is going to form a hematoma. And this hematoma is the one that's going to make the base for a regeneration of the bone. And then you will have in the hematoma, phagocytic cells will come and eat anything that's not supposed to be there. Fibroblasts are going to put the fibrous tissue. Chondroblasts are going to put the cartilage. And then you're going to change it into bone. But in the middle, you're forming something called prochalus, which will become the callus. And this is important to know what exactly is this, the prochalus or the fibrous collar. So it will be something like this. Look. This is a fracture. After the hematoma, phagocytes, and then fibrous tissue cartilage, you will see something looks like this. You see this? This is called the, the, the prochalus or the callus. And these are fibrous tissue that's going to make like a splint temporarily. If you ever had fracture before, or you know somebody having a fracture, give him like a couple of weeks or something and feel you will not see everything straight you will see an elevation did you see that before you will see something like a swollen like a bone that's swollen not straight and this is going to disappear a couple of months later is going to disappear this is called the, the prochalus or the callus which is fibrous tissue that's splinting the bone temporarily and usually after you heal from fracture, you still see that's not all flat. Like I feel like this, for example. This is my humerus, okay? Everything is flat, 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 and you see an elevation here, right? And I can tell you, I had a fracture here before. So it doesn't go flat as it used to be, smooth as it used to be. Because of this callus, it takes a long time to disappear. So the prochalus will be... Uh, replaced by bony callus and the bony callus is going to reshape and it's going to straighten by time until and, and the bony callus will be remodeled until it go back to normal so most important thing is how does the healing start hematoma is number one bleeding hematoma and then phagocytosis you remove anything that's not needed Fibroplast, both the fibrous tissue. Um, chondroplast, both the, 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 the cartilage. 
and then you make the procallus and then callus. And the callus is a bony splint to straighten and to keep the shape of the bone temporarily until it starts to remodel and return back to normal. What affects the bone healing? Why do you say that um, this person take two months to heal and another person take four months? Why? What's the reason for that? Number one, how much damage occur? Okay, is that simple line that happened, take less time, or is it commutative fracture or something? <laughs> what happened actually? How much local damage? Is it simple? Is it compound? Is the skin and muscles affected or not? So this is number one. Number two, proximity of the, bo the bone ends. And that's why if, if we go to the doctor and he's putting a splint or a cast or something, they have to make sure that the bone is very close to each other. It has to be like this, as close as possible. If it is far away, that will take more time. If there is a foreign body, it has to be removed. If there is inflammation or infection, it will take more time, so it has to be treated. If there is um, uh, uh, something that's compromising the blood supply, it will heal slowly, uh, slower. It will take more time to heal. So these are factors that you actually need to know um, that's affecting the healing. Why? Think about it. Why somebody take two months and somebody else take four months? If both of them have the same problem, same spot, same fracture, why he take two months and, and he take four months? These are the factors. How much damage? Maybe this person have more damage than this. Maybe he's having compound fracture versus simple fracture. This is one. When you go to the doctor, did they put the bone exactly close to each other? Or there is a distance that was left there. That's why if I have a fracture, you can just wait for it until it heals. There has to be an x-ray, and they have to make the bones as close as, as possible to each other to heal faster. If there is a foreign body, remove it. Infection, inflammation, heal. It has to heal, or it will take, or it will take more time. Blood supply, is it compromised? Like if this person is having inflammation and infection around you. This can actually compromise the blood supply going to this area, so it will take more time. Beside, of course, if he is in good shape or not, uh, nutrition and so on. Um, complications that can occur to any um, anybody having a, a, a fracture. He can have um, bony spasm. The muscles are, are sp uh, spastic spasm to protect the area. He can get infected, ischemia. Fat embolism. Fat embolism is something that's important to remember. And this is usually, uh, we hear this scenario, it's very frequent. Grandma, she fell in the bathroom or something. Just something that's very minor. And her, his, her pelvis is broken. And a piece of fat, left, go to the blood, and go within the blood and until it go to the lung, ca causing pulmonary embolism. And this is called the fat embolism. So it start as fracture and end as, as pulmonary embolism. And this is called the fat embolism. Did we understand this? Fracture, a piece of fat, go to the blood, travel in the blood until it go to the lung, causing pulmonary embolism. Deformity can occur if, if, if the bones are not straightened, if it's not uh, aligned, and so on. Um, treatment can be closed reduction, or it's reduction anyway, meaning you put it back together. Whether from outside, or if it is commuted fracture, and what's commuted fracture, meaning, are we following? Commuted fracture, what does it mean? You have several pieces. Okay? It's not aligned, and you have, more important, that you have different pieces. It's not like one bone become two pieces only. No, there are several pieces. So if that's the case, they have to open inside, remove anything, foreign body, or fractures, or, or pieces, or something, realign, and then the healing occur. And this is called the open reduction. So you can do it from outside, or you can open and go inside. Compartment syndrome is 
If you ever had a fracture before, or if, you, or if you know somebody having a fracture, when they put the cast, the cast is not supposed to be too tight or too loose, right? It has to be something in the middle. If it is too loose, the bone is moving, and it will take more time to heal, right? If the bone is moving, it will take more time, of course. If it is too tight, it will compromise the blood supply, and it will cause edema, and this is called compartment syndrome. So compartment syndrome happened because of tight cast. The cast should not be tight. The cast should not be loose. It should be in the middle. Otherwise, it will compromise the blood supply, causing ischemia. Um, and it, it might le even lead to gangrene. Now, mixed condition is called dislocation. This is not a fracture. This location means, this location means out of location. This is basically what it is. And do you know what's the most common joint to be dislocated? The shoulder joint. Very frequent to be dislocated, okay? And dislocated means the head of the humerus, it moves out, okay? So they are not in contact, it's supposed to be like this. This is the head of the humerus, and this is the glenoid cavity of the scapula. It should be like this. Okay? Not like this. And why shoulder specifically? Because this is too shallow. So it can easily go like this. And the hip, it's like this. It's not shallow. It's too deep. Okay? So this location is separation of two bones at the joint. Okay? And how to know, how to diagnose that this is this location, the shape looks different. Like I'm standing up like this in front of you. And you look at my right shoulder and my left shoulder. And you will say, your left shoulder doesn't look normal. It looks like this bone is moving and this is, there's a depression here. Right? It looks different. So if, this, if the joint looks different and the bone is moving away, or, or the head of the, of the humerus, for example, is moving away, it's not in contact anymore, this is called dislocation. Okay? Here it is. This is the head of the humerus, and it's supposed to be here. It's moving out. So obviously, if you look at this shoulder, you will see this area is flat. It's not supposed to be flat here, right? You see this area flat. And this is this location. Sprain and strain are two different conditions. They are very close to each other. Both of them is a tear. But tear in what? Tear in a ligament is called sprain. Tear in the tendon is called strain, and this is important to remember. What is a sprain and what is a strain? Sprain is tear of ligament. Strain is tear of a tendon. Avulsion is complete. It's not a tear. Complete cutting the ligament. So if your ligament is affected, you should ask, is that a sprain or avulsion? What's the difference? Look at this. This is a sprain. Part of the fibers is cut, right? But the rest is still okay, right? Versus this. This is avulsion. This is a sprain. So you're cutting just a little part of the tendon. This is called uh, the tear or the sprain, and just leave it some time, it's going to heal. If it is cut completely, this is called avulsion, and this will need surgery or something. And the most important thing to do is, in all these cases, is immobilization. Reduce movement. Do not move it. They can put you in a cast. They can wrap it. They can do something. Don't move it. Okay? Don't move it. Immobilization is a key for the treatment of these cases. All right? Are we following so far? Immobilization is your key. Don't move it. Don't use it until it heals. Some other injuries can be like a muscle tear or repetitive injuries or something. The muscle tear can occur if, if, if you do like over uh, expansion or over stressing the muscles. Um, if a small percentage of the muscle fibers are torn, this is called the first degree. Uh, a good part of the muscle but not complete, this is called second degree muscle tear, if the whole muscle is cut, you call it the third degree. 
diagnosis, what I mentioned in the beginning, is enough for all of this, okay? For diagnosis. Remember in the very beginning, bone problems will be bone scan and x-ray, muscles will be EMG or a biopsy the, 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 at the very, very beginning. And for the joints, you can do radiography or MRI, or you can insert an endoscope and see what's happening inside. Treatment of joint injuries, the first thing is usually called rice. And this is important to remember. What's rice? Rice is rest, immobilization, compression, and elevation. This is something like first aid. Somebody is having a problem with the joints, don't move, rest, immobilization, either with a cast or something else, compression to put it back together, and elevation to don't use it. And then they can use NSAIDs, and, um, which is like so something like ibuprofen, Advil, something like that, and other stuff like physiotherapy and so on. But rice is important to remember here. Bone disorders. Osteoporosis is something that's important to know. And osteoporosis translation, osteo means bone. Porosis means porous. So osteoporosis is, means porous bone, meaning the mass and the density of the bone is decreasing. Okay? And this can be primary or secondary. Primary means it just happened. Age, for example, especially for ladies. We know that osteoporosis occur a lot with older females, right? Why? Because of the hormones decreasing. And the hormones, here's what the hormones are, do, are doing. The hormones make vitamin D, absorb more calcium, so you have more calcium available to make the bone stronger and higher density. After menopause in females, the level of the hormones drops. So the vitamin D is not doing the same absorption. You don't have enough calcium. So what would be the treatment for this condition? Either give estrogen, which is not very frequent. A lot of females will say, okay, after menopause, I don't need additional estrogen anymore. I don't need it. So how to solve this problem? Think about it. What was the estrogen doing with the bone? It was helping vitamin, stimulating vitamin D to absorb calcium. So you need vitamin D and calcium. I give you vitamin D and calcium from outside. This is how to solve it, okay? Because a lot of uh, ladies, they say, no, I'm not going to take any uh, hormonal therapy. If it is secondary due to something else, uh, like excessive glucocorticoids, do you know that if you use cortisone for a long time, you can get osteoporosis? Glucocorticoids. So I'm not talking about the cortisone, the local cortisone. Like we know the cortisone, you can get it over the counter from any pharmacy, right? Even from dollar store, and you can put it like if you have itching or something. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about systemic cortisone. If you're taking tablets or, or, or shots or something, if you take it for a long time, you can get osteoporosis. And if that's the case, the treatment would be stop cortisone. Okay, but this is an important piece of information to remember. Glucocorticoids, which is cortisone, can lead to osteoporosis. What are the most important two things? Hormonal, decreased hormones like menopause. This is one. Decreased vitamin D and calcium. This is two. Glucocorticoid, this is number three. And these three are important to remember. Okay? So obviously the first two, that will be that is primary. The, the second one is secondary. So basically, what's happening is the bone resorption exceed the bone formation. Can you tell me which cells are taking the upper hand in this case? Do you remember the, the three types of cells? Osteo. What are the three types? Osteo, blast, osteo. Last and osteocyte. So, which will be taking the upper hand? Osteoclast taking the upper hand over the osteoblast. Remember that the osteocytes are not the bone forming cells. 
These are the mature bone cells for maintenance only. For maintenance. So how the osteoporosis occur? Osteoclast take the upper hand over the osteoblast. Okay? And this is how we get the osteoporosis. <laughs> So this is one, so you start to lose the compact bone. If you do a scan to the bone density, you will see that there is osteoporosis. And those people can, get, can easily get compression of the vertebrae. Okay, and this is what I was talking about in the beginning. Do you remember compression fracture? If you fall down in your age, if you fall down, you can get compression fracture, but even if you don't fall down and you have osteoporosis, you can still get compression fracture. So the vertebrae are going to be compressed because it's too weak, looks like a sponge, it's porous. And some people will can get kyphosis or, scoli uh, or scoliosis. Do you know what's kyphosis and scoliosis? What is this? This bending of my bag, this is called kyphosis. Kyphosis. Scoliosis is like this. So side, in the sides, this is called scoliosis, okay? If it is like this, it's called kyphosis. Did we get this idea? So why this is happening? Why I did this or this? Because the bone is too weak, okay? So it's not making me stand straight. And the muscles actually are contracting from one side. This is important to remember. Otherwise, I wouldn't uh, stress on it, okay? Did you get what you need to know about osteoporosis? Reasons, how to diagnose it, how to treat it. I mentioned treatment here, right? Vitamin D and calcium. So do not, don't later say, you said the treatment is not important. I didn't say that. I said, generally speaking, the treatment is not important unless if I tell you, and I told you here, right? So this is important to remember. Treatment, vitamin D and calcium. Can lead to what? Can lead to compression fracture, kyphosis, scoliosis. These are the different factors that lead to osteoporosis, osteo um, predisposing factors. Um, and I, I, I give you specifics like age, older, specific, specifically females, uh, due to the hormonal factors, sedentary lifestyle. Here is the rule of the thumb. Just take it as a rule. Use it or lose it. Anything that you use, it will be strong. You don't use it, it will become weak. So can we get osteoporosis just because we're not doing an effort? Yes. You can get that. Like you're laying down in the hospital or something for six months and you're not moving at all. You will get osteoporosis. And why? Just understand the rationale. You, if you don't use something, the body will say, okay, obviously you don't need it. And that's why you didn't use it for four, five, six months. So why don't we take the important stuff from there and use it somewhere else, right? You're not going to use it anymore. You're not, you're not using it anyway. So if you are, even if you're in a hospital, they tell you, right? They tell the patients, you have to move around, right? But I, I can't exercise. Don't exercise. Just move around, right? So your body will say, okay, I'm still moving, I'm still moving, I'm still using my bone. I will keep it strong. If you don't do that, sedentary life or not moving, you lose it. Osteoporosis. So this can lead to osteoporosis. If you're not getting enough vitamin D and calcium, obviously, and um, cortisone is one of the reasons. And treatment, most important is you get vitamin D, calcium, and phosphate, vitamin D, calcium, and phosphate, and exercise to avoid um, losing or uh, the osteoporosis. So uh, the treatment here is specific, and you need to know it. How to treat osteoporosis? Vitamin D, calcium, and, phosph and phosphate, that's one. Number two, exercise, weight-bearing exercise, okay? There are other things, but this is the most important of all. Next condition is rickets and ostimulation. Rickets and ostimulation is almost the same. Vitamin D deficiency, and the bone will become weak. What's the difference? 
rickets in children or stimulation adults. Is that clear? This is what you need to remember. Rickets and osteoporosis uh, and osteomalacia. Both of them are vitamin D deficiency and the bone is weak and start to bend. Start to bend. Rickets is in children and it's more severe. Osteomalacia is in adults. Are we following so far? Rickets and osteomalacia, it's the same problem. But children versus adults. Paget's disease, most important to know about it is, the bone is destroyed and replaced by fibrous tissue. And this is the problem. Leading to pathological fractures. This is the most important thing to remember about Paget's disease. Bone destruction and replaced by fibrous tissue. And this will lead to pathological fracture. And because bone is weak, so it can lead to different types of deformities. Osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis. Itis means inflammation or infection. In this case, it's infection. Infection of the bone. Osteomyelitis. Bone infection, it can be bacteria or fungus, but most likely it is bacteria. Okay, so osteomyelitis is bone infection, osteomyelitis. And because it's infection, there will be pain and fever and so on. This is what I just described. I described kyphosis, right? I described scoliosis. Lordosis is like this, which is the opposite of this. This is kyphosis, this is lordosis. And lordosis is coming from lords. Not, not Lord, not God. Lord in, 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 a, in a British um, um, a parliament. They, they used to do like this, like I'm a Lord, so I'm very important, they go like this, okay? Like they are very important people. They describe it to be like this, but this is, this is pathological condition, but I'm just seeing where the origin came from to remember it, okay? So Lordosis, you're walking like a Lord, like this, okay? Um, kyphosis is like this. Scoliosis is side to side. Now the tumors. Tumors of the bone can be primary or secondary. Primary means it started from the bone itself. Secondary means it come from another spot, like this lady had breast cancer, and now the breast cancer metastasized and go to the bone, and this will be secondary. It can come from the breast, from the lung, and, and so on. Uh, the most common type is called the osteosarcoma. Osteosarcoma. And here is how it looks like. Chondrosarcoma is malignant cancer of the cartilage. Ewing sarcoma is basically the same but in adolescence. Next group of problems is called dystrophy, muscular dystrophies. These dystrophies in general, there are different types, but they are autosomal recessive disorders. Do you remember autosomal recessive and dominant or not? Do you remember the, the inheritance from biology? Autosomal recessive means you have to have both parents you have to have both parents, the mom and the dad, the father and the mother, both of them, they carry the gene. Otherwise, you don't get it. You can get it from one only. Uh, the most common type of muscular dystrophy, and dystrophy means dystrophy. This means difficult or abnormal. Trophy means growth. So dystrophy is abnormal growth, basically. Abnormal growth of the muscles. Uh, there is an abnormality in the growth which the muscles will degenerate. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is the most common one.
Very important to remember about Duchenne muscular dystrophy is that the pelvic region is very weak, so they go waddling and they cannot climb the stairs. So if you ask them to climb the stair, you go like four or five steps, that's it. I can't go more than that. This is diagnostic. Okay? This is important to remember. Unique, something unique. If this is a child who cannot climb the stairs, he can just go four or five steps and stop. He might be having the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. There are other things, deformities like um, uh, kyphoscoliosis and respiratory problems and everything, but the most important to remember is this. The pelvic region, the pelvic girdle is specifically weak, so they cannot climb the stairs and have waddling gait. Diagnosis, again, this is autosomal recessive, so they need to check the genes, genetics. And they can do EMG and, mus and muscle uh, biopsy to diagnose the condition. Treatment is all supportive. Just remember it this way. It's all supportive. There is nothing really that, that can treat this condition. It's all supportive. Like physiotherapy is one thing. They can do some massage. They can do some exercise. Supportive appliances, braces, whatever. It's all supportive, but it's not a real treatment. Unfortunately, there is no curative treatment. These are the different types of dystrophies, but I told you the most important one, which is Duchenne. Okay? Duchenne muscular dystrophy is the most important of all and good enough to remember. Fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia. You know what algia means? Pain. Yes. So pain in the muscles and there is fibrosis. Always cut the word into different pieces and you will get what it means. If you know that algae means pain and you can use it with any other part, algae. So fibromyalgia is pain in the muscles and there is fibrosis of the muscles. So the muscles will be stiff and painful. Muscles are stiff and painful and those those patients usually have some sort of depression as well. So there is a psychological component. They have an anxiety or depression, okay? So what's fibromyalgia? Pain in the muscles. The muscles are, are stiff and painful. Pain in the muscles, so the muscles are stiff and painful, okay? Plus, they usually have depression or anxiety. Uh, predisposing factors, there will be uh, stress, fatigue, um, age from 20 to 50, that's all not the most important thing. But if you get the, first, the very first part, that's good enough to remember, okay? Fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia, pain, stiffness of the muscles. Okay? Pain, stiffness of the muscles, and there is usually uh, a psychological component, which is depression or anxiety. Treatment is, tre is treatment for the pain, basically. Painkillers, and uh, I mean, if you, if you just remember this, it's pain and stiffness of the muscle and depression, right? So what do you, what do you need to treat? Just treat the pain and the depression. That's it. The two problems that they are having. There's something called Larica, but I'm not expecting um, any treatments just for your information. But all what you need to know here is pain, stiffness of the muscles, plus depression or anxiety, what to treat, how to treat it, treat the pain, treat the depression. Now we join to disorders. First condition is called osteoarthritis. Most important thing to remember about osteoarthritis is that it is degeneration of this. What was this? The red. Arthritis. 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 Arthritis.
articular cartilage. So when this articular cartilage starts to degenerate, degenerate means you lose it, you start to lose part of it, this is osteoarthritis. Okay? Degeneration of the articular cartilage. From what? From wear and tear. There is no real problem. It's just you're overusing it, like you're getting older, so you use it for longer time, or you're playing soccer too much or something like that. In all cases, if this articular cartilage degenerates, it's called osteoarthrosis. Ah, uh, osteoarthritis, I mean. And this will, um, uh, will result from wear and tear from increased weight bearing or lifting. Like you're playing soccer, you're too much soccer, you're um, a weight lifter or something like that. So that will cause. So I want you to remember something here. The weight bearing will cause osteoarthritis and will prevent osteoporosis. Did you get the difference? Osteoporosis comes from the opposite. You're not doing an effort, you're not doing a weight-bearing exercise or something like that, you get osteoporosis. But if you overdo it, you get osteoarthritis. And obviously, because you're losing this cartilage, what was this cartilage doing? It was covering the end of the bone, so the bones will not have a friction with each other. The movement is smooth. Cartilage is something that's very smooth. The bone is not smooth. So now, if you lose the cartilage, the movement will be harder, there will be some friction and pain. How the cartilage is broken? There are some enzymes, the tissue damage from the abusing of the, of the, of the joint, so there are some enzymes that are released to accelerate the process of damaging um, the cartilage. And there will be something that you also need to remember, something start to develop within the joint because of the enzymes that are released and because of the degeneration of the, of the joints, which is there will be some cysts, something called osteophytes, bone spurs, okay? This is something that's going to start to show up within the joint, and this will make the joint movement even more limited. It was limited in the beginning because you have this inflammation, because you have this losing of the articular cartilage. Now you have other things start to show up within the, the joint. Cyst, osteophytes, bone spurs. These start to show up within the joint, so the joint space will become narrower, and the movement will be even harder. Okay? Did we get this? This is what we need to know, okay? The generation of the articular cartilage from wear and tear, the cartilage will become rough, enzymes are released to break down, and you start, um, new things start to show up. You start to see some cysts. If, if you do an MRI, you can see that inside later on. You can see some osteophytes, and osteophytes is just abnormal bone growth, like a piece of bone growing like this within the joint, so it will start to uh, make more friction within the joints. So look at this. This is showing you what's, what is happening. So you see the yellow that's lost here? This is the, the, the first and the most important thing. You're losing the cartilage, basically. Articular cartilage degeneration, this is the most important, from wear and tear, and from enzymes that are released. But other things can start to show up. Like look at this osteophytes, it's not supposed to be like this, this swelling here. So this will limit the movement. You start to have cysts like these. So this will also start to limit the movement. And the, points, the, the joint space will become narrower. So all of these factors will limit the movement. So what do they have? Limitation of the movement and pain. I'm focusing on certain parts, which is the core of each one of these conditions. So you have to remember exactly what I'm talking about. Okay? Anything else, read it if you want to, but you cannot forget this. So if I ask you what is limiting, why people with osteoarthritis have limited movement? Because of, the, because of the pain, because of the cartilage that's degenerating, and the new things that are developing within the bone, like cysts, uh, spurs, and osteophytes. So this is something that you have to remember.
what is the cause of the etiology? Generally speaking, anything that make more friction of the cartilage. So the cartilage will be damaged. Whether you are overweight, aging, so you're losing the cartilage, wear and tear, you're uh, abusing your joint, you're, you're over-exercising, whatever the reason is, in all cases, the joint will be regenerated anyway. And there's, there is a genetic factor, but, um, but it comes from wear and tear anyway. Sign and symptoms, most important to remember is pain and limited movement. This is the most important of all, okay? Pain and limitation of movement. There are other things, but this is the most important of all. Pain where specifically? In the weight, in the weight bearing joints. What's the most frequent? What's the most frequent location? Which joint? Knee. 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 The knee is the most frequent location. Because it is a weight bearing. Your weight will go like this and, and goes mainly on, the, on your knee. So this is the most frequently, but it's big joints in general. And remember the location because we will do some other conditions that will have other locations. So this is something that's happening. Does it happen in one joint or two joints? Bilateral or unilateral? What do you think? Why would it be unilateral? Isn't it you're using both joints at the same time? Right? It's wear and tear, so you're abusing both joints at the same time. Why would it come in one side? So it's bilateral in the big joint, specifically the knee. It is bilateral, of course. Why would it come in one? Are you playing soccer with one leg only? Are you abusing one leg only? Are you carrying weight on one leg only? No, right? It's usually using both of them. So it's important to remember that it's happening in big joints and it's bilateral. Pain, limited movement. Treatment is usually supportive. So supportive physiotherapy and all that good stuff, exercise and everything. But here is one thing that, that, that might be done that, that's, um, that you need to remember. If the whole cartridge is gone completely, knee replacement. There is no other treatment. You cannot have bone with bone. You will not move. Bone with bone, no movement. Okay? So this is the only time that they need to replace. Otherwise, it's all supportive. Um, there is something like chondroitin sulfate, for example. Uh, there is something like um, uh, glucosamine, uh, chondroitin sulfate, and all these. These are just supplements to prevent uh, the progression of the disease. It's not going to treat. Some people think that if I take glucosamine or chondroitin sulfate, it's going to rebuild my cartilage, so I, I, I will return, I'll go back as it used to be. That's not true. It's mainly to give you enough substance for your cartilage to just slow down the progression of the disease or, or, or of, the, of the problem. Of course, you, you can have some uh, painkillers and stuff like that, but this is the main thing. Now rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is a completely different condition. Number one, it's an autoimmune disorder. Autoimmune. There are antibodies against the joints. Okay? It's usually in females or women more than men. It's a systemic inflammatory disease. So what do we need to know about it so far? It's a systemic inflammatory disease due to autoimmunity. Okay? What will happen in the joints? First of all, it, it, it will affect <coughs> small joints. And this is completely different from osteoarthritis, right? I told you to remember that osteoarthritis affect large weight-bearing joints. This, small joints, okay? And there, there will be some synovitis, like the synovial membrane will be affected, but there is something called panis. And this panis is actually important, because panis, when it forms, it's a granulation tissue 
but this granulation tissue that's called the panis will start to secrete some enzymes that will break the, down the inside of the cartilage uh, or the inside of the joint, I mean, even further. So panis is something that's important to remember. There will be also fibrosis and ankylosing. And, and this is, um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis is one of the important things to remember, specifically this part, the pathophysiology. It's very important to remember, okay? One of the important subjects. What do you need to know so far? Rheumatoid arthritis, number one, systemic inflammatory process due to autoimmune disorder, okay? It's an autoimmune. Antibodies, you make antibodies against your own joints. And you will, you will make synovitis and panis. And panis is specifically important. Panis is a granulation tissue that secretes enzymes, destroying your cartilage and destroying the inside of the joint even more. Uh, usually those people, unfortunately, they will get some fibrosis. So these joints will become fibrotic after some time. And if you ask them to move, they can't move. They can't move their fingers, for example. And they also have something like ankylosing. And ankylosing means stuck together. Okay, the joints will become fixed like this. If I have ankylosing in this, bend your, your finger, I can't. Try, I can't. If I try to bend it for you, I can't. There is fibrous tissue inside. And where does the fibrous tissue came from? From the panis, which is a granulation tissue secreting enzymes. Okay, are we good so far? So this is the, what you have to remember. Deformities will occur later on and contractures. And here's all what we talked about, including the ankylosing and the panis. Inflammation, ankylosing and panis, which is very important to know. Look at this deformity. It will be like this, and they can't even move. Okay? Is it affecting smaller joints or, or, or larger joints? Rheumatoid. Smaller joints. Um, remember that osteoarthritis was affecting the, the, the larger joints, right? These are all clues, by the way. So if you see a question, you, you all, also, always ask yourself, are we talking about small joint or big joint? Big joint, osteoarthritis, right? With the wear and tear and other things. Small joints, we, we're talking more about this. Okay? Deformities. Fibrosis, anus. There are some systemic effects, something like fatigue, depression, fever, malaise. So these are systemic signs that happen with rheumatoid arthritis. Did we say anything systemic with the osteoarthritis? We didn't say anything systemic, right? But this has some systemic problems. Osteoarthritis? No. So that's is degeneration of the joints, of the big uh, joints, of the cartilage of the big joints. So what those people will have? Inflammation, as I mentioned before. Stiffness of the joints. Move your fingers, I can't. Bend your fingers, I can't. Stiff, fibrous tissue inside. It's painful. Red and swollen, okay? Affecting small joints and it's bilateral. Osteoarthritis, big joints bilateral, right? Are we following? Osteoarthritis, big joints bilateral. This, big, uh, small joints bilateral. And the joints will be stiff, red, swollen, painful. Stiff, red, swollen, painful. Remember those, stiff, red, swollen, painful. Okay? And then there will be some deformity. These are the general or systemic side effects. Treatment, not the most important, but as usual, uh, exercise, activities, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, Advil, stuff like that, analgesia. Uh, there's something called DMARTS or disease modifying antiromatic. Treatment is not the most important here. Juvenile or A? One thing that's important here to know, even if it's not, not written here, this is something that's important to know. What juvenile means? Smaller age, younger age, right? The one unique thing that happened in juvenile RA, 
that the RA factor is not there. You cannot see the RA factor. What's the RA factor? If you have rheumatoid arthritis, the no normal people having rheumatoid, I mean older people, having rheumatoid arthritis, I can get a blood sample and I will see the RA factor. Juvenile, they don't have the RA factor. Unique enough? This is unique. So what's unique here? Younger age, no RA factor. There is a factor that appear in the blood. In most of the cases, does it appear in juvenile? No. Did you get this point? So this is a, a, a special category, and all what you need to know here is juvenile means younger age, no RA factor. There are different forms, but I already told you the most important thing to know. Now infectious arthritis. So far, we didn't mention any infection, right? I said osteoarthritis, and this is degeneration, right? I mentioned rheumatoid arthritis, and this is autoimmune, right? This is now infection. And it's, and it's important to remember the other name, which is septic arthritis. So infectious arthritis, septic arthritis. Here is your clue here, single joint. Did we say any single joint before? No. So this would be single joint. And what else do you need to know? Remember that it is infected, so it will be red, hot, swollen. Red, hot, swollen. And it's more in the bigger joints. And so if you hear, just as a student now, if you just hear it, if you hear the, the history, somebody's telling you what, what, what they are experiencing, can you tell? Osteoarthritis versus rheumatoid arthritis? You can actually tell. Just, um, uh, is it one joint or both joints? One joint. Is it hot, red, and swollen? Yes, septic arthritis. No, it's two joints, two joints. Okay, um, and do you, do you have it for a longer time? Yes, it's a, it's a joint, you have limitation of the movement and you have some pain when you exercise or carry weight? Yes, this is also arthritis, right? Female that's having in the smaller joints and it's bilateral, right? Can you tell? They, they cannot move, there's stiffness and pain in the joint. You can tell from the history. Okay, obviously infectious arthritis, it's infection, so they need antibiotics. Gout. What do you need to know about gout? Gout is another inflammation of the joints due to the position of uric acid. Uric acid. This is completely different from anything else, right? It's not degeneration, it's not autoimmune, it's not infection, right? This is something different. This is the position of uric acid in the joint. Why would uric acid deposit in the joint? Here is what's, what's normally happening. When you eat meat, specifically red meat, you break down the red meat, the proteins, and you end up producing uric acid, okay? Uric acid, you lose it in the urine. Is that okay so far? What if you're eating too much red meat, beyond the capacity of the kidney to get rid of it in the urine, or if the kidney is affected, now uric acid will start to build up and increase the level in the blood, right? And will start to leave the blood and go to the joint, invade the joints, start an inflammatory process, and this is gout. Okay? Did you understand this? Increase uric acid, whether because you increase producing the uric acid, you're eating too much, specifically red meat, or you cannot get rid of it. In both cases, uric acid builds up in the blood, increased level in the blood, and then it will go to the joints, leak out somehow, go to the joint, start, elicit an inflammatory process, and this is called gout. And it's called specifically atophus or tophi, which is a nodule of the uric acid. Uh, this is just taking a sample from the joint and seeing under the microscope. Nothing too important. Treatment, simply reduce uric acid level in the blood somehow. And give them something to, um, to, to reduce the pain. And obviously because it's inflammation, it will be red, swollen, and painful. Next condition is ankylosing spondylitis. What does it mean? Ankylosing, I talked about this before. Do you remember ankylosing? 
that we talked about before in the rheumatoid arthritis. Ankylosing means stuck together. So the, 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 the joints will become stiff and ankylosing. You need to remember this. Ankylo means stuck together. I put it here, I added it in the, in the slides to remember it. Ankylo means stuck together. Like in the rheumatoid arthritis, the two bones here are stuck together. You can't move it. You cannot move it, right? So ankylosing is spondylitis. Ankylo, ankylo means stuck together. Spondyl means vertebrae. So the vertebrae are stuck together. This is the condition. Are we following so far? Ankylosing is spondylitis. The joints stuck together. Uh, I mean the vertebrae stuck together so they, they don't move. It usually start as sacroiliitis and then start to go up with the vertebrae. Do we know what the sacroiliac is? Do we know the sacroiliac joint? What is your sacrum? This? And where is the ilium? This? There is a joint between them. Do you see that in the, in the skeleton? There is a joint between the sacrum and the pelvis in the side, right? This joint is called sacroiliac joint. This joint specifically is a point of start of ankylosing spondylitis. So ankylosing spondylitis starts as sacroiliitis. And then it will progress to the vertebrae and the vertebrae will be stuck together, limiting the movement and causing deformity. And this is what we need to know about this. Did you get this one? Ankylosing spondylitis. The one thing that's also unique about enclosing spondylites, besides that the vertebrae and the sacroiliac joint fuse together, and this is ankylo, that what it means, fuse together, ankylo. Beside that, it will be obviously a limitation of the movement. Imagine that I can move like this, right? Because my vertebrae are free to move. There are joints in between. If they are stuck together, it will be like one piece, like a piece of wood, right? So the movement will be very limited. Start as sacroiliacs and progress in the vertebrae. It will become like one piece. Limitation of movement. Uh, the gait, the movement will be different. There will be some sort of deformity. Whatever it's fused, like if it's fused in this um, uh, position, it will stay like this. Kyphosis, for example. Okay? And start, usually the, those patients will complain from morning stiffness. When I wake up in the morning, I have stiffness and pain. But when I start to move, it gets a little bit better. This is unique for ankylosing spondylitis. Of course, treatment will be for pain and physiotherapy and all that stuff. Not the most important. See how they look like? The vertebrae are stuck together. Start at sacroiliitis, the, the vertebrae stuck together and look, looking like this, which is kyphosis. Other inflammatory conditions, not the most important. Just remember like something like bursitis, inflammation of the bursa. That's it. Synovitis, inflammation of the synovial joint. Tendinitis, inflammation of the tendon. That's good enough to remember. And that's it.